each and every one of you for coming here to the Goldhar Lounge in Don Mills, Ontario to wish Marvin Goldhar a happy birthday to you. Happy 50th birthday to you. You're wonderful. You're terrific. Happy birthday, dear dad. Happy birthday to you. You're terrific. Go on, get out of here. Dear Marvin, it's been two and a half years since we met, and now you're a favorite pet. Your daughter I'll marry, then a grandson named Harry, and wedding his bed while well, you bet. A night in a garden is dandy, a week in New York it's fun, but a birthday at 50 wha with all friends and family, surely there's no better one. Now one is the beginning number, and you've began it the past 49 times, but now rest assured your years will be pured by the love of your favorite ones. It's upside down. Randy, she's your number one daughter, and Jeff, your number one son. With Myrna, your wife, you've got quite a life, and with me walking in, oh, what fun. Happy birthday, Marvin. Marvin, a birthday poem. A birthday at 50, we're not talking labats, from weightlifts and baseball to pipes and hats. Well, at 50, you're young, your fun's just begun, and as dads happen by, you're the number one. Now, I know it's hard to express in repose how a dad like you is a natural rose. I'll leave you by saying more happiness is waiting around every corner you goes. The end. You have to get on the waist up. Okay, go. No, no, you want There was a young man named Marvin. For 28 <laughs> years, we've known him. We have watched him mature from horse shit to manure. But that's all I can think of. Way, this way. Not, not in front of my face. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. Okay. Yeah, down. Oh, down, down here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I got. It. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm continuing on. Now goodbye to all hardware, from college to bluer. It was time to move up, and start to tour, all around our country, the places you played, and many's the time, home, you wish you had stayed. Harold's in. Are you still running? No, he's not running. No, he's not running. Okay. He's not running. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't see myself. I'm ready. Okay. Then in New York we saw your name, and we're sure you'd make it. We hope with great fame. For all of us here, our di our days you made bright. We celebrate your years on this your great night. And now, Marv. Please don't despair or frown, for as this is your night, then this is your crown. Do you get that? Got it. Okay. To tell you the truth, when Myrna told me to uh, come up with something for this thing, I sat back for two, three days and tried to figure out what I was going to say and how funny I could be and remember all the old past stories about Marvin. The amazing thing that I discovered sitting down and trying to analyze my relationship with Marvin Goldhar is that I didn't even know him for almost the first 30 years of his life. Being nine years older than me, <coughs> being nine years older than me, uh, we didn't really have a whole lot to do with each other. As a matter of fact, my earliest recollection of him is about 45 years ago when he 
begged my father to let him take his dog to the corner with him while he made a bank deposit. And when he came back, I remember him carrying the dog in the carrier. It had been hit by a car and was dead. Hey, is this a highlight here? All right. Then the next highlight I can recall was about 31 years ago when I actually first saw Marvin in a play at Oakwood Collegiate in the Inner Willie where he pranced around in long underwear wearing a red hat and was someone else's conscience. The next strange thing that comes into my mind after that period, and I guess it's about 29 years ago or so, was uh, Myrna coming into the picture. I don't remember Marvin dating or anything else, but I remember Myrna coming around, hanging about, and the next thing I knew they were married. And one of the things that highlighted that period, I was about 12 years old, is that Marvin and Myrna used to come over every uh, Friday night to the house and bring me stamps, and I built up a stamp album. And then my birthday rolled around in December 27th of that year, 29 years ago, and the thing I wanted most in my whole life was, uh, was one of those newfangled hockey games, the one with the little metal men that they have nowadays, uh, and you, you move all the little uh, steel pins up and down to move the men. And Marvin and Myrna brought me over one of the old-fashioned hockey games. I was heartbroken. I had, I had, it was a long, about, I guess about this long and about that wide. And what it was was little wooden pegs with a funny little metal piece on it. And you pulled only one unit and it moved all five of your forwards and defensemen and it shot an alley. And well, to tell you the truth, I have that hockey game today, 29 years later, in mint condition. And boy, am I glad I got it. I guess the next period of time that I can recall is the Bluer Hardware. Marvin and Herbie ending up in the Bluer Hardware. Uh, Marvin never getting up in the morning. I used to work there on Saturdays and take the cash. Uh, Marvin, Herb, and I, and my dad used to go down together. We'd all arrive over at Marvin's house over in Brighton, and he'd never be up. And finally, we'd drag him out of bed, pounding on the door, and he'd come downstairs. We'd take, uh, we'd take a trip down Bathurst Street, and we'd be, uh, we would be into the, uh, uh, to the store and what, and I think we spent half of the day just looking down the street at the lineups at Onestead's. Everybody was going in for some antifreeze that was on sale for 99 cents. Um, I guess the next step after that came Randy. Randy was born and I was, uh, I became a babysitter. And uh, my biggest recollection there was that it always took me two diapers to work out Randy, uh, one for each cheek. I never really did get the hang of it. The next recollection I have after that was a couple of years later when Jeffrey was a little older and he, uh, he starched his spray starched his turtle and let it float around in the toilet. I'm, I've never been able to quite figure out why he did that, but th that's, that's something that seems to stick in my mind. Uh, I guess following that, and this is about 20 years ago when really things changed with Marvin and I. Uh, we became, I guess, friends in a sense because all of a sudden we were getting into a same area. I was going to university studying communications. Marvin had already been well into amateur theater. And here I was back just prior to the summer working for a Saturday at the store. And Marvin came up with this gem of an idea. He was going to go away to do summer stock theater all summer long. Well, I can tell you how big that went over with the family. And of course, the final answer was that they recruited me who spoke barely spoke eh, the English language, while Marvin was uh, adept in English, Italian, German, and Hebrew, or not Hebrew, but Yiddish. Uh, and they had me replace him. I knew nothing about tools, nothing about anything. And Marvin shipped off to Summerstock Theater while I took over this hardware. Is there, any, is there any wonder why it went down over the next couple of years? It never did recover from my summer there. Uh, but Marvin had a great time, and that really is, uh, I suppose, what really pushed him really into the, into the flow of things in the professional theater. He came up with another gem of an idea just a few years back. He decided that he'd ship out to New York. And uh, he was off in New York and not doing too badly. Actually, things were coming quite along quite well. And then he was set back one morning, uh, about uh, oh, five, six in the morning. I got this phone call from Myrna. Marvin had had a heart attack in New York. So the two of us rushed down to New York to see him. And his never-ending sense of humor, was, which was the thing that seemed to amaze me all the time, never left him even in the condition he was there. I remember our arriving the first time seeing him ashen white, his hair white, his eyebrows white, his face was white. And there, written at the end of it, his bed, it said, Mervyn Goldbar. It was wonderful. Not just a, a, another typical day in his life. Um, 
the nurses uh, used to come in to, uh, he, he used to jiggle the little uh, plastic things which were stuck onto his body so that it would send signals into the outer hall and the nurses would come running in and say, what's the matter, what's the matter? And then they check him and they say, oh, it's okay, you've just lost the lead. And he'd look up and say, yes, it's not the first time. Uh, he had a Chinese nurse that I recall that he used to try to order sweet and sour spare ribs from. She didn't think he was very funny at all. Uh, and I guess the last one was uh, my frustration during that period with Marvin Goldhart because I, I, I didn't know what to do for him. He was lying there. He, we didn't know what to do. Who could I tell? So I thought of who did I know in New York and I thought of Lorne Michaels who was producing Saturday Night Live and I phoned him up and I said, Lorne, I don't know what to say to you or why I'm calling you, but Marvin is on the intensive care, he's on the critical list at the hospital at Bellevue. I just thought you'd like to know. And the next thing I know that he and I think Belushi and Aykroyd and a couple of the others showed up at intensive care, broke in with flowers and a little note on it that said, we said Saturday night live, stupid. So that was the typical type of life that I can recall with Marvin. It's amazing that with all the funny things and all the things I know about him all through the years and the things he said, that I can't think of anything funny about him. So I thought I would do one thing because I figured all the rest of you will be telling little highlights and c comical things all evening. I thought I'd say something that I promised myself I would tell people uh, after having lost a couple of relatives and uh, looking back, and I'm sort of bring down this whole evening this way, but I always said one of the things that we never tell anybody is what we really feel about them when they're alive. So I want to tell you that I'm very proud that you're my brother and my friend, although you piss me off quite a few times as my client. Thanks very much. So whenever oh, okay. I step off, I can just step off, right? Yeah. Film. Did you like film? It's not film. It's jewelry. <laughs> who said that? Well, Marvin. Marvin who? Marvin Goldhar. Don't you know Marvin Goldhar? Well, let me I tell know you. Marvin. Well, let me tell you about Marvin. I met Marvin the very first time 21 years ago in 1962. He was the oldest living apprentice at the Garden Center Theater in Vineland. I was the house manager there, and all the apprentices arrived, and they're all like 16, 17, 18, and I noticed this other name down there, I hadn't arrived yet, his name was Marvin Goldhar, and I said, oh, who's this guy? And he said, well, he's a Jewish hardware merchant from Toronto. And um, I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, yeah, he's coming down here to be a, an apprentice, uh, and his wife and his two kids are going to Crystal Beach, they rented a cottage for the summer. So Marvin came to the Garden Center Theater, July 1962, when I first met my friend Marvin, and he was wonderful. We'd sit down at the beach late at night, and he'd tell stories to everybody right off the top of his head, and it was really sensational. He played the amazing Dr. Clitterhouse. That was in a, Dr. Clitterhouse, that was in a, in a sort of a workshop production. He was also in Take Her, She's Mine with Joanna Pettit, but we won't go into that, will we, Marvin? <laughs> and then years went by, and uh, Marvin, the Jewish hardware merchant, decided to get out of the hardware business. And in 1968, he was about to sell the hardware store, and I went to audition for a show called uh, Sunday Morning. And I suggested to Marvin, when I phoned him, I said, you're going to be closing the store soon you should come and audition for this show because it's going to be live every Sunday morning and you can do it. And you can do it even if you don't sell the store. So he said, okay, and he came and did that show. And we worked on that for 39 weeks, seems like. We started off at something like $500, $700 a week because we were doing film and jewelry. $500 a week? And then we went from there down to $135.75 by the end of the run of the show. It's the only job we've ever had that worked that way. He did on the air to me one day. We were doing a thing that Howard Bateman wrote having to do with what to do with your um, paint cans in the spring or how you store them. And so Marvin and I were about to talk and I said, well, what do you think, Marvin? And he said, well, he did that to me live on television. Of course, I split up for the rest of the time.
cracked me up. It was wonderful. The next thing we worked on, of course, we worked on Hart and Lauren a lot. We, uh, we did a whole bunch of stuff that never got on the air. It was really, really good. I think Marvin's best bit, though, was when he, he did Hitler. He sang it my way. It was wonderful. And then we, he sang Hitler, he sang at the piano, and played da 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 yet in a small way. And all he saw was the side of him, and as he turned to the camera, it was Adolf Hitler. He was wonderful, and he even sang well. We also auditioned for Spring Thaw. Howard Bateman produced that one, too. Marvin sang MacArthur Park, I think it was, and he uh, had a prepared piece from a, a show, and... Uh, I stood up on the balcony and watched him do his piece, and then they called me down, and I had nothing prepared as usual. And uh, so I sang Ubla Dee, Ubla Da. <laughs> and I didn't know it, and uh, the piano player didn't know it, and nobody knew it, and Marvin thought I was dying. As it turns out, I got in the show, and Marvin was an alternate. He, was a, he had better billing than I did, though. It said featuring so and 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 so, and Marvin Goldar as the duck. Or was it the fish? Well, it was one or the other. Anyway, uh, time went on. We were doing Spring Thaw one night, as I recall. It was a Saturday night. We had this one sketch we did where it was uh, a really funny sketch. If it was going well, we were given permission to play with it a lot, you know, expand it, ad lib, do what we could. And uh, this one Saturday night, we were in the second show, and Marvin, and Marvin said, um, just before the show was started, he said, here I am, a 36-year-old man sitting here down in this little room with four other guys, putting brown stuff on my face. And I got the feeling that things were going to go too well that night. We got into the sketch, we're working like crazy, and I'm bouncing off Marvin, he's bouncing off me. And uh, he finally turned to me and said, can we get on with it? Always the true professional, my friend Marvin. I just loved you for it. Anyway, then we went on and we did Trouble with Tracy together. We went to Fort Lauderdale, Florida together. We went to porn shows together. We went to steam baths together. We did almost everything together. And it's been 21 wonderful years. And along with my girlfriend, Pat, I'd like to say, we'd like to say, happy, happy 50th birthday, Happy birthday, Marvin. We love you. What do you think about Marv Goldhar, Zelda? I think he's a terrific guy. And Marv, I want to wish you a very happy birthday and many, many more. She always was funny, Zelda. <laughs> you know, when I think of Marv Goldhar, uh, of course, being his brother, one of the things that comes to my mind is when we were young kids. Marvin, being about three and a half years older than me, he liked to fool me a lot. And he pretended things like he could speak foreign languages. Okay, time's up. <laughs> And he would say things like, vula vula, avuva, avuzu, avuva, that's French. Or he'd say, gesundheit, achtung, tung, tung, that's German. But Marvin never really fooled me. I never wanted to say anything to him then, but Marvin, I knew that you weren't really talking foreign languages. And many of the other things that come to mind very briefly, when Marvin and myself had an argument when we were children, the first thing we did was split up our comic books. And we used to keep them in an orange crate. And Marvin put his comic books on the top shelf, and mine were kept on the bottom shelf. And to this day, now I have all of the comic books. Isn't that an interesting I story? I wish birthday. him a very happy birthday, and I hope to be here for his 100th birthday. very important uh, message for you delivered by Courier. Hear ye, hear ye. Royal Proclamation issued this 29th day of April in the year 1983 of the reign of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the August occasion of the anniversary of the 50th year of the birth of her most loyal subject, Marvin Goldhar. 
All loyal subjects are herewith advised that we have on this day chosen to bestow on the said Marvin Goldhar the following honors, titles, and property in recognition for his long years of service to the Crown and for his meritorious contributions to the arts. To be elected to the Royal Order of the Garter as a Knight Commander. Second class, of course. To be granted in perpetuity the titles Earl of Skymark and Duke of Manhattan, with all lands, estates, and inherent encumbrances, including cockroaches and other vermin. To be awarded a fellowship in the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons with the title of Doctor of Canine Studies. And to receive the Dr. Ballard's Award for 1983. In recognition of unforgettable performances on stage in Spring Thaw and Stalag 17 and many other productions. He will henceforth be known as Sir Marvin, the last of the Red Hot Lovers. And be awarded the 1983 Walter Matthau Award. With recommendation that he ought to be in pictures. In recognition of his achievements in the world of commercial advertising, he is to receive an appointment to the Board of Governors of Hamburger College. Courtesy of McDonald's. A lifetime supply of Pepto-Bismol. A carload of shaving cream. Courtesy of Gillette. And a pot of coffee. Courtesy of Taster's Choice. And henceforth he shall be referred to in the mass media as Mr. Clean. In recognition of his fine achievements in his personal life, he shall be awarded the 1983 Mr. Nice Guy Award to be given by all relatives and friends who know him for being the good all-round shit that he is. Signed this 29th day of April, 1983, London, England. Elizabeth II. Liz. Closer? <laughs> I'd like to. I haven't got any jugs. Well, then, make I'm so nervous. <laughs> Dear Marv, when I lay sick in bed as a teen, in came a visitor called Marv, a coke he did bring. After chatting a while, I did say, there's a lovely girl called Myrna across the way. Oh no was the answer I got. I thought my shidduch was all shot. Next thing I heard, this romance was hot. A wedding present had to be bought. All was great, and in the hardware business Marv did go, but was not to be happy until he was in a show. So here we are now, from North York to New York he does go. Many happy returns, let's get on with the show. Oh, thank God that's over with. <laughs> The wrestling years of 47 and 8 may have made Marvin a little sedrate. Since I'm fairly new in the scene, a pleasure to know you, it's been. A friend like you is hard to find. Please keep my mother's raincoat in mind. Just think it might have been instead of me. So here's wishing you... Whoop, I gotta go like this now, Marv, for the tall guy. <laughs> here's wishing you happy birthday from us three, Gottlieb, Gould, and Grafstein. Right here, on top of it. You were, eh? Just oh, I gotta, I gotta wipe my glasses. Hold them, Mike. Hold them. Oh, up. they're dirty. <laughs> Late last second. You know what star is? You know. <laughs> Late last second. First of all, I have to be able to read, right? You told me to memorize. So who's gonna start? Um, I am, but wait, wait. You're start? Okay. But it's something that we have to do, like, together. Jo jointly. You should pardon the expression. Jointly. No, I don't. I have my well, own I'm script. <laughs> well, you have to hold that for me. And we're recording. 
what can be best said about Marvin's philosophy of life is the oft-repeated story of the first time his neighbors on Brighton Avenue, he sat at the kitchen table and promptly put a coat hanger on his head. When he was questioned as to why, he very calmly replied, it feels so good when I take it off. We discovered in Marvin someone who was as much off the wall as ourselves. We followed with great interest his the theatrical career after leaving Bluer Hardware, point B to point B, Bluer Hardware to Dr. Ballard's, quite a transition. After our initial season, at, after your initial season at Prude Homes, who would have, who would ever forget marvelous Golden Bar? I remember vividly, I do, <laughs> our working together in Stage 2 10 at Temple Sinai, directing you, performing with you, and running drama workshops, as well as your many local appearances at Spring Thaw, at the Crest, Love at the Colonnade, and your TV spot on Saturday Night Live. But mostly, your brief but memorable filming appearance with Zaveria Hollander, the Happy Hooker. To do justice to Marvin and the many products he has promoted in radio and TV commercials, a typical day in Marvin's life might run like this. After awakening in the morning, after a good night's sleep, made extra fresh by washing the bed sheets with downy fabric softener, he takes a shower and shaves with his Gillette Foamy, making sure that the toilet bowl is fresh with a liberal sprinkle of sandy flush and that everything is deodorized with wizard deodorizer. His throat is a bit scratchy with a cough, so perhaps a spoonful of Formula 44 will help. He now feels like a little refreshment and downs a large glass of Allen's apple juice, then gets dressed, hops into his Toyota, and drives to the nearest McDonald's for his 99 cent egg McMuffin. And afterwards, he finds his car very noisy. So he stops by his nearest throughway muffler shop for a replacement. And while waiting there, he spies a stray dog which looks a little hungry as it happens. He has just a spare can of Dr. Ballard's in the car. So he feeds the dog. From here, it's off to make a bank deposit at his favorite Royal Bank branch. He decides to tell the manager one of his favorite stories. The manager laughs so hard, his teeth almost fall out. But Marvin just happens to have a tube of denture cream on him and saves the day. Next stop is the nearest Mappin's Jewelers to get Myrna a little trinket. And afterwards, since he has promised to help a friend with some renovations, stops off at his nearest Canadian tire store for a Black & Decker drill, and while pulling up to his friend's house, admires his new Mazda in the driveway. After helping out, by this time he's developed quite a thirst, so it's time for Molson's Light. Next stop is the publicist's office to pick up some publicity stills processed on Kodak paper, but the PR man insists Marvin ride with him on his new Yamaha. At this point, he's decided to make supper at home, so it's off to the nearest Dominion store to pick up chicken sticks, Crisco, Bix Pickles, Hellman Salad Secrets, Kraft Miracle Whip, and Laura's Secret Puddings. Approaching home, he reminds himself to pick up his weekly Lotterio ticket at his favorite Max Milk store. After preparing and eating a humongous dinner, he cleans up the kitchen with Mr. Clean, but finds it necessary to take some Pepto-Bismol before relaxing in front of his RCA TV and putting on his Kaufman slippers. He lets out a sneeze, but fortunately, his ever-ready box of Kleenex is by his side. And so, so ends a mythical day in the life of our birthday boy. boy. May he continue in good health and happiness for years to come. Very good. Was that good preparation? Wonderful. Welsh characters, Canada, Harry Abrams, New York, Irv Schechter, Los Angeles, and SBV. Los Angeles. I just want to say something about Marvin Goldhar that I hope will go down into history, and that is, he is absolutely the loudest snorer this side of the border. The problem is, is that he does most of his snoring in New York, and believe you me, and Myrna will attest to this, it is probably, well, it is the worst thing to live with. Now, I hope he grows out of it. It's about time. We were overwhelmed at this uh, talent 
that we've uh, recently met with uh, Marvin Goldhaw, and uh, we did a bit of investigation as to the origin, wh when it all began, this talent. We went back to the first day he was born, and we obtained the issue of the New York Times and the Toronto Star. And in these issues, it revealed to me how this talent began. Let me call your attention to the, to the entertainment section of the New York Times, dated Saturday, April 28, 29th, 1933. It says on the screen, John Barrymore opts out will be replaced by Baby Goldhaw. And Diana Winnard in a sound picture version of Reunion in Vienna. And in the I wonder if he knew what was going on at that time. And in the Toronto Daily Star. On Saturday, April 29th, 1933, when the weather was. Moderate, southerly, windy, fair, quite mild. Some turbulence caused by a new birth. Sunday, fresh east and southeast winds, mild, followed by 50 years of calm weather. And the paper cost two cents. The Marie Chevalier came to Toronto. And there he starred in a bedtime story with Helen, 12 trees, and one hour old Marvin Goldhar. Also starring Edward Everett Horton to at the Imperial Theater. Today, in Toronto's Neighborhood Theater, we would like to read you some of the current shows that were on. 42nd Street, at the Bloor Cinema, and at the Oakwood. At Runny Mead and Parkdale was Rome Express. At college was George Arliss in King's Vacation. At the Bell Size was State Fair. At Will Rogers, Janet Gaynor, and Baby Goldhar. And The Good Companions was on at the Royal Alexandra Starring. Today, 10 stars, 50 players, cast of thousands, and one hour old Marvin Goldhar. Good luck, Marvin, and in 50 years, we will get the front cover of today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Put your purse down if you no, want. I'll tell you, you'll have to stand Where the piece of cardboard on the cardboard. Oh, God. And, uh... Lawrence is going to go first. <laughs> no, you're going to go first. I am not. I don't want you to... Lawrence, because you're saying you more than me. This has nothing to do with it. You have, to, you have You have to. Go ahead. It's the proper thing to go first. I know no, no, no. Ladies go first. Honey, this doesn't go. Okay. Are you on tape now? I have an argument. Go. No, 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 it doesn't go. go. Don't you dare. I'm not, not okay. Uh, Sorry, it okay. doesn't go. Okay, let me, let me. I'm going to... How close do I have to keep it? Does that sound about right? Hi, Marv. You know, I always said you had a way about yourself. Everybody knows Marv's got a way about him. Like, for example, for example, when I was, oh, about four years old, got my first bike, Marv found out, and he had a way about him. He came over. I didn't give him a ride right away. He had a way about him. He just picked up a brick and threw it. Eight stitches later, talk about uh, bad habits. We lived on Montrose Avenue. 
Marv introduced me to smoking on the third floor of our grandfather's house. Marv got the cigarettes and I <coughs> choked. And talk about smoke, everybody thought someone else caused fires on Lansdowne Avenue. Ha <laughs> ha Marv, we know better than that, don't we? The garage, the back storeroom, right. And as the years go by, Marv grows up, goes to high school, we lost contact. All of a sudden, I heard of a Davy Star. Davy Star, the wrestler. Now, after years of bodybuilding, I want you to stand up, Marv, and just let's have a look at that shape. And talk about shape. Sparibs are Marv's best thing. Why, a whole generation of pigs were eaten up by you, Marvin. And by the way, talking about sports, Marv is unique in his attitude towards sports. Baseball, football, hockey, basketball, he hated them all. He did, however, have one idol like we always do, a sports idol. In hockey, mind you, his name was Metro Presti. He idolized him. He used to play with the Detroit Red Wings. Remember, Marv? Why, Metro Presti's mother didn't even know Metro Presti. Then Marv ventured into the hardware business. Became a merchant, a hardware merchant, imagine. But he didn't care about hardware merchandising. Marv's pet project was his pet goldfish. He had the best aquarium on Bloor Street, 400 goldfish, one of the largest aquariums on Bloor. But what was unique about this, that Marv had a habit of sometimes leaving the heater on in the aquarium. Monday morning, he opened the store, 400 Cisco's, you're right. And by the way, after the hardware business, he blossomed into what he's doing now, acting. Back and forth, back and forth. Prudhomme's, Toronto, Prudhomme's, Toronto. Marv knew every broken white line on a Queenie. And talk about habits, Marv has one of the best fetishes that anyone would want to have. A piece of cotton here, a piece of cotton here. Well, I remember one time we were driving into Buffalo. Marv discovered sitting in the car a little thread about there. About 20 minutes later, it wound up up here to his crotch. That's his pet fetish. And talk about card playing. <laughs> Marv has got to be the worst, the worst gin rummy player. Right, Marv? Over a 10-year period, it went zero for 520 and wins. And talk about idols. Every teenager growing up always has their actor or actress idol. Marv had three in particular. Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, Gower Champion. Marv couldn't dance a step, could you, Marv? And by the way, fruits? <laughs> Aside from the fruits Marv knows in New York, Marv's favorite fruit in life was always a lemon. It reminded him of every car he ever owned. But show business career has not been all glitter and bright lights, but also made him a philanthropist of touch of such. Back and forth over a period of a month, Marv deposits through about $2,000 to American Airlines. But in summing up, Marv, I want you to know you're not just a cousin, but a very close friend since our age of five. I had no say in choosing you as a cousin, but I am forever grateful that I have chosen you as a friend. Marv. Well, Marv, Lauren said it all, but I'll just add a bit. Did I hear you say you're 39? Sorry, that's Jack Benny's line.
But when we are as old as you, we may tell that story too. You don't look bad, but for the fact, your middle's rounder, more fully packed. Your eyes are shot, your teeth no better. You've got more lines than a 10-page letter. Now don't feel bad and start to pout. We have some hints to help you out. You still can set the girls agog with at least a week's pay and a seeing eye dog. Now I'll just tell you a little more to make you feel great. Your nookie days are over, your pilot lights are out. What used to be your sex appeal is now your water spout. Time was when of its own accord, from your trousers it would spring. But now you have a full-time job to find the blasted thing. It used to be embarrassing for every single morning. It would stand and watch you shave. As old age approaches, it sure gives you the blues to see it hang its withered head and watch you tie your shoes. Happy birthday, Marv. Many more. He's going to say something. No, I can't. Let me do it. Security. I can like start sucking my thumb. Do you all know that in his youth, Marv was a wrestler? True. Pictures with this wonderful body, muscular, taut, sexy, mmm, yummy. But that wasn't Marv. We called him the Hulk. The only difference between today's Hulk and Marvin is the shade of green. Marvin then decided he would like to play Mr. Hardware. Love playing with tools, he did, but alas, this too bored him, so he decided to play for real. Now he has the Jolly Green Giant as a sidekick, had several puppies that used to go around in a circle for him until they realized their only reward was Dr. Ballard's. Marv then tried to become an M&M, but gave that up because he kept melting. He then became involved with foam, which soon turned into a fetish with him. He'd squirt the stuff everywhere until Myrna put her foot down and fell through. Happy birthday, Marv. We love you. Say happy birthday. Say happy birthday. Happy birthday, Marv. Are you ready, dear? I think. Okay. I saw your little girls exercising yesterday. Oh, you did? They are fantastic. I was huffing and puffing watching them. Okay, here we go. We're recording now. Hi, Marvin. Happy birthday, dear. Many more healthy, happy birthdays. Happy birthday, Marv. I know we were told uh, no birthday presents. And just the same, we brought along a little token from, uh, from a fantastic fan. At this point, I'd like to unwrap this, see if I can make it. Well, he made the promise to give it to Marvin. Well, I think we're going to unwrap it anyway. Can you zoom in on this? Or, huh? Yeah. Are you zooming in on this, sir? Uh, that this guy <laughs> wanted us to make just to my little Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I want to add at this point that I've had a tremendous uh, offer to sell my condo in this place, but there's no way because I've always wanted to live next to a star. <laughs> Have you, got, have you got anything to say? Uh? Happy bad. birthday and many happy returns of the day. Not enough is from all your children. You got it. Okay. Da, 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 da. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Marvin. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. May you, you live a thousand years. years. May you drink a thousand mm -hmm. Cokes. Pepsi. Whatever. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Marvin. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. To you.
a roast to our host. You turn on the tube, and who are they roasting? Dean, Bob, and Frank, they're toasting. They joke and they laugh and they tell funny little stories. They brag of their triumphs and all of their glories. But right here tonight, without further ado, we'll roast our host, who's sweet, dear, and true, to Marvin. Lo and behold, he hit the big time. In the Big Apple, he thought everything would be fine. He didn't know what danger lurked. Marvin worked, Myrna shop, then Myrna shop while Marvin worked. So to our hosts, let's raise our glass for a toast. Happy 50th, Marv. P.S. Remember, kid, you're only as good as your last picture. Oh, it wasn't bad. Hi, Marvin. <laughs> This is really, 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 really hard, but probably everybody said that, so I'll just get right to the point. I want to wish you a very happy birthday, and as I was thinking about what I would say here tonight, um, it occurred to me that one of the very few facts that I do know about you is that you like to eat food and stuff and desserts, so um, one of the things that um, pleases me is eating desserts as well, and I decided to share with you one of my very, very, very favorite recipes. And uh, this is a real serious recipe, so you're gonna have to play this tape back over and listen to this again if you wanna make this. Now, the reason I chose this was uh, because it sort of reminded me of you. It's um, sweet, yet tart. It's got a bit of a crust, and it's very simple. Now, I was also gonna say that it's easy to make, but um, I'm not absolutely certain about that. So, okay, here's what you do. This is called self-crusting lemon pie, and it really is, it's delicious. Okay, uh, I'll go through this very quickly here, but uh, I can give you the recipe later if you want. Okay, you mix three tablespoons of flour with a scant cup of sugar. It calls for a full cup, but I like to go easy on the sugar because I like the tart part. Um, then you add the juice and grated rind of one large lemon and one large or extra large, which is really good, egg yolk. You stir in one cup of milk, and one tablespoon of melted butter. That's all you do, that's one bowl so far, that's all you've done. Now, beat the egg white that's left over from the egg yolk until it's stiff and fold that into the other mixture. That's all there is to it. Now you put all of that in an eight or nine inch unbaked pie crust shell and you bake it at 350 for 35 to 40 minutes. <laughs> it's really yummy. <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. Now. Actually, I do have somebody else here with me tonight um, because I, as you know, am president of the Parkdale chapter of uh, the Marv Goldhar um, Society, <laughs> the Marv Goldhar Fan Club. And uh, here is actually somebody who lives in Parkdale, and uh, I'd like to just speak with him for just a moment. Hello, sir. Hello. I'm president of the Marv Goldhar Fan Club, and... Um, I understand that you do live in Parkdale, where we yes, are I situated. Do. do you know Marv Goldhar? Marvin Goldhar is yes. a hell of a fellow. He is indeed. A lot of people have said that. He's a real... What? That's a hell of a guy, is uh, Marvin. You must have seen his work, perhaps, or... Um, I've seen Marvin Goldhar's work. Where? Do you, uh, do you, have, you uh, have you lived here in, in uh, Parkdale most of your grown up life? I'd like to say one thing. Yeah. I think that, uh, speaking as a fan of uh, Arvin, that he is a hell of a entertainer. <laughs> and that I haven't seen a guy as funny as uh, Mel on the television in Parkdale this week. Is that right? That's Marvin. Since Marvin. That's the guy. Yeah. The so, uh, <clears throat> is there anything you'd like to do to commemorate Marv Goldhar's birthday? I'd just like to say that I think uh, the, the thing that Melvin should be remembered for, mostly by the people who, who remember him, is uh, that he's a very, very, uh, well, he's a, he's a generous man. Yes, he is. Not, not to a fault, but uh, nobody would say that was his greatest weakness. No, no. But uh, he's a generous and a kind person. He is kind. Uh, He's got a nice carpet in here. It's a <laughs> beautiful carpet it's for a... I have never seen in a bedroom a carpet either as thick or as clean as this carpet. 
And that is one of the things that he should be remembered for in Parkdale. <laughs> Where there aren't many carpets. <laughs> That's true. Well, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And we'd both like to wish you, Marvin Goldhar, a very, very happy birthday. And what the hell, have lots more of them. <laughs> okay? Goodbye. <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to public uh, speaking. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, here she is, folks. Star of stage screen and reefer parties. And bedroom. Ooh. How <laughs> did you know? Hey, listen. You saw him in Reaper Gladness? Were you in Reaper Gladness? Yes. Oh. Okay, never mind. All right. A <laughs> birthday is for celebration, and Marv, this is your occasion. We know you hate sports immensely and love Chinese food especially. So we hope you like this and enjoy this surprise for a special birthday boy. We see you on the tube all the time. You're so successful, it's a crime. Mm. <laughs> so for an active man, this active message here. Happy birthday, Marv, with a rousing cheer. Oh, uh, God love you, child. <laughs> You're wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, that's really super. I love it. <laughs> well, we'll see you. <laughs> there, they sent my report. Zoe Adams Bookings. Marv, I want to wish you a real happy half a century. And to cheer you up, I've written you a little poem here. They say you're over 30 now. It's too hard to believe. On stage, the way you paint those eyebrows in, all the world you do deceive. They say you're over 40 now. Who cares? Jokes about age are dumb. And I guess at your age, you've heard them all. So that cheap, to that cheap temptation, I will not succumb. They say you're over 50 now. I, I wish you lots of luck. I say age is all in your mind. And they can all go and wish you a happy birthday now, like I do. Zoe, the duck. El camarón que se duerme se lo lleva el corriente. Good night. Hi, I'm sorry Barbara Wawa didn't attend tonight, so I'm her substitute. All I want to say is, happy birthday, Marlon. Happy birthday, Marv. Happy that? birthday, Marv. Okay, that's it. That's